We're here at the European Business Summit and uh, the report from the EBS is Who Cares Who Dares. Uh, it was authored by INSEAD and in particular by the eLab team led by Bruno Lanvin and Niels Fonstadt. The report is basically saying there's a, a skills issue in Europe. Can you briefly say what is the, uh, the crux of the issue? Already for some time, businesses in Europe and government to some extent have been identifying a skills crunch. That is, Europe has ceased to have the means of its ambitions when it comes to skills in areas like engineering, IT, technical, scientific uh, skills. This pre-existed the crisis. The crisis is making it even more serious, but also gives opportunities to address it in an innovative and imaginative way. And you, there's a six-point plan basically calling for action. So it, it, this is quite important for the conference itself, that it's not just essentially a talking shop. Mm. You're trying to get some uh, action related to this. That's right. And one of the things that we do is uh, we've created this skills pyramid that uh, really identifies three tiers of skills that are important to enable uh, Europe to be more competitive. And uh, so we go beyond uh, traditional skills that are looked at, uh, uh, basic li literacy and, and math skills, those are the tier one skills. Tier two skills are around occupations. Those, those two tiers are, are um, already well understood. We add to that by including a third tier, which we call the global knowledge economy talents. And those, um, I think one of the reasons why the commissioner uh, was so enthusiastic about this report is that we really um, are helping define what exactly are the skills that are necessary for Europe to remain competitive. And it's those top tier skills are the ones you say are lacking within Europe. Europe gets a C. Uh, we, what we do with the skills pyramid is we've graded uh, the European countries uh, along with Singapore, uh, United States, other, other competing uh, countries. And when you look at this set of 42 countries, uh, the European Union gets a C in, in that third category. There are some countries that still do very well, though, the Scandinavian countries, because we've seen this in the innovation reports as well. They are champions. That is, when we look at uh, uh, e-readiness, competitiveness, for instance, as the World Economic Forum defines it, um, if we look at uh, ability to generate uh, uh, good people from the secondary and tertiary education uh, sectors, uh, we have top competitors like Singapore, but immediately after that, we have countries like Belgium also. So it's not just limited to Scandinavian countries, but clearly there is a source of best practices that is just begging to be expanded and taken an advantage of. So the fact that it's not all gloomy uh, should uh, trigger some action uh, at the European level. But one thing we discovered in putting this study together is that most of the lessons we have identified for Europe can indeed be applied to many other parts of the world. So how does uh, Europe compare to the US and Asia? North America and Asia? Well, it, it depends on, on which of the tiers you're looking at. So you can look at the complete p skills pyramid uh, and, and you'll see the rankings, or you can look at it by the separate tiers. So one of the things that we've done, one of the things that, that comes out when you grade this set of 42 countries is you see uh, there's actually two peaks. There's a set of countries that grade very high on the skills pyramid, and there's another set that grade very low. And so Rudy Thomas, the CEO of uh, FEB, noted that actually those that are in the low end uh, actually represent an opportunity for reskilling. And it's important for Europe as a whole to not forget that, that uh, lower half. Because especially with uh, some of the recommendations that we make, such as uh, making um, uh, immigration and mobility easier, uh, you know, the, these issues become uh, the issues of everyone. This is essentially the um, search for talent, global talent. Um, the process that Singapore's going through right now in trying to encourage foreign talent to come to its shores. Uh, but even with, but within Asia as well, you get such a disparity between, say, Singapore and some of the uh, developing countries. This is a problem uh, the European Commission in particular is very well aware of. Um, one of the, rec the six recommendations in this report is to indeed encourage mobility within Europe and also between Europe and other parts of the world. So clearly Singapore is a place where these issues have been at the forefront 
of discussions, thinking and action for a long time. Um, Abu Dhabi is another place where uh, reliance on external and importing talents has been both an opportunity and a challenge for quite some time. One of the lessons that um, we can draw from the crisis um, is that, of course, the pressure is very high on enterprises to shed people, to reduce the, the workforce. The big warning in this report, which was echoed by the Vice President of the Commission this morning, by Commissioner Figel later on, is don't overdo it. Don't let your skilled people go, because there is a, a global war on talent. This war will increase when recovery happens. And if you let your good people go, it will be much more expensive for you and much more difficult to get back on track with your competitors. And this is true not only for companies, it is true also for national economies. Just briefly on the action items, are you calling for, say, um, girls to get uh, more science training, uh, are you calling for e-learning and so on? What would you see are the, the key items from that, uh, from that list? Well, first, the, um, the, the purpose of the report was not to make recommendations, it was to start from existing problems and see how they could be addressed concretely. There are probably millions of other good measures that could be considered, but those won't happen to relate to specific issues. One of the specific issues in Europe is that when we see the gender gap diminishing in many areas, for instance in political representation, in the media, in a number of areas, we see it broadening in things like technical learning, scientific learning, studies, which is a paradox. And the, the, uh, of course the interesting question is why? Why are girls less interested in scientific studies than they were five years or ten years ago in Europe? And the answer is twofold. First, they don't consider those careers as particularly exciting. And second, they have a perception that the glass ceiling may be stronger in those sectors than in others. Clearly, it is up to the business sector to fight those perceptions. Uh, and maybe they are more than perceptions. Maybe there's a reality that also needs to be, to be addressed. So this recommendation to get more girls into scientific studies is actually addressed to, largely to the business sector, saying prove to these young girls that indeed they are not making the wrong choice if they go to scientific studies. The European Commission has already established a strong knowledge agenda with the Lisbon agenda and the Lisbon strategy uh, and clearly this goes along the lines which are mentioned in this report. What is very important is as Commissioner Figel was mentioning a few hours ago, uh, not to waste this crisis. A crisis is very expensive, it's very painful. Let's not waste it, it can be an opportunity as well. And if this agenda can be focused around a certain number of themes like those six actions suggest, then this time will not have been lost. One of the other key purposes of this report is um, INSEAD is in a, in a very privileged position to bridge uh, three key stakeholders that are involved in this challenge. Universities, the government, and business. And one of the purposes of this report is precisely to, to strengthen that bridge. So it provides a common point of discussion for these three important stakeholders. And so what we've seen here, for example, today at the European Business Summit is precisely dialogue between these three stakeholders around the, the contents of, of this report. And so that, that's one of the goals. And, and uh, going forward, uh, the research center, eLab, is, it will continue to, to uh, strengthen that bridge. The, um, one of the lessons that emerges from uh, the recommendations, which is somehow between the lines in every recommendation, apart from human capital education, it is innovation. That is, if older economies, like most European economies are, want to take advantage of the fact that you know, they've had universities for 900 years, they have had research centers for so many years, etc., and still don't have the entrepreneurship drive that all the parts of the world, like the US, have, they have to focus on innovation. They, they have to find the ways by which they can retain value based on brains. Uh, because commoditization of activities will make those activities go to lower wages economies. That's part of the, of the game, it's part of globalization. So once this is accepted, 
where is the value added? Where is the, the source of success in Europe? It has to come from brains uh, and not just from uh, heart or muscles or guts only, which are also needed. Uh, but brains have to do with innovation. So if those recommendations can be put in that broad framework of stimulating innovation, they have a good chance to, um, to turn into something concrete. Do you think there's the political will to carry um, through these sort of uh, changes that you think are necessary? Frankly, I think there is. I think this was uh, heard already several times today. There's a political will of politicians to do it. And there's a political will from politicians to listen to the business sector about how to do it, which is rather exceptional. Uh, on their side, the business sector, and we heard from Jean-Philippe Courtois, from Microsoft and from others already, they're saying, we are ready to do that. You know, we've been begging for this to happen for years. So if you want us to invest money, to stimulate innovation, to create something with young people, we are all for it, we are ready to do it. So the crisis is really an opportunity to accelerate a process that was there, but somehow latent or just growing too slowly until now. Bruno Lanvin, Neil Fonstadt, thanks for joining us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you. Thank you.